Storms are temporary. Did you know that? Isn't that good? You ever thought about that? Storms are temporary. Why don't you turn with me to 2 Timothy, the second chapter. And I want to talk about endurance today. Endurance. You know, so many times, uh, I don't know about you, but what I've gone through, difficult times, tests, tribulations, trials, whatever you want to call it, I've often what would rather have preferred that didn't happen. How about you? You know, sometimes we get to a place where we ask God, why me? Why is this happening to me, God? And the Bible is very clear in that when Jesus spoke in chapter 16 of the book of John, just as he was about to take off, just as he was about to go to the cross and leave, he told his disciples, you're going to have tests. Guaranteed, you're going to have trials. And that's the one thing that we struggle with, I think, mentally, is why is this happening? Why do I have to go through this? Why is this so much harder than it should be? Am I the only one that feels like that sometimes? The bigger picture is that we can get to a place where we actually rejoice in tribulation. Jesus said, be of good cheer or rejoice when these things happen. If we haven't got to a point in our lives where we can rejoice in the middle of a trial, in the middle of a test, then we haven't arrived. There's still some things that we need to learn. There's still some trials we need to go through. Because Jesus wouldn't tell us to be cheerful and to take, you know, to rejoice in trials if it weren't possible. So our perspective can change as we grow in the knowledge of Christ. You know, Paul said when he talked about the thorn in the flesh, and it's real clear, he says what it is. It's a demonic spirit that came after him. It doesn't say it's a sickness. But he had so many revelations. The Bible says, you know, he's talking about a man. He calls, I believe, himself a third per as a third person. There was a man caught up into the third heavens, he says. And he saw such things, such astounding, ecstatic, glorious things. That, and then he couldn't even talk about those things. But the Bible says, because of the extent of the revelations, Paul said, I was given, was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, an angel or a messenger of the devil, he says, who came to buffet me, to harass me. You know, God allows things in our lives to happen because we need to change. We need to grow as he has, as he is, into that same uh, picture into that same image, the Bible says. And Paul said, this happened to me lest I become arrogant. Full of myself because I got these revelations. Paul saw things that we will never, most of us will never see, ever. And the temptation for Paul was to become boastful of what had happened to him. And, you know, he said, I'm not going to boast in that. I will not. I refuse. He said, even though I had a right because I actually saw these things, I learned these things. Such things that cannot even be uttered in this life were so glorious. But he said, I won't do that. I will instead boast and rejoice in my own weakness, in my own frailty, in my tribulations, he says, in my tests and trials. Why? Because when I, when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's, we're going to start there. Let's go there instead. We're going to come back here to 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Corinthians 15. Paul 
In other places, talks about his weakness. He talks about the trials and tests, and even James talks about having the ability to be um, to rejoice in tests and trials. You see, the reason we don't want to rejoice in tests and trials is because we're selfish. Did you know that? Our focus very often times is me. Your call to walk as Christ and to live in this world as sons and daughters of God is not based on that image of selfishness. It's built on the image of selflessness. Selfless. You know, this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus gave himself for all. That was the focus of his whole life. That was the focus of his mind when he went to the cross. Was to die for everyone else. His focus was not self. We are called to live selfless lives, but we can't get there until we go through trials. Until we get a revelation that Jesus had that took him all the way to the cross, that allowed him to endure every test. He endured every, every speech of hostility against him. He endured every act of hatred, every act of violence. He endured that, and he kept his heart and his mind right. See, he was selfless because his his focus when he got up every day was now how not how am I going to get through this? That was not his focus. See, that's our focus, and this is how, where we get trapped. Lord, help me get through this. I hate this. This is too uncomfortable. Can't you make it go away? Paul said he prayed three times. For God to take away this harassing demonic spirit that operated through men who hated him, who tried to trick him, who tried to deceive him, who tried to set him up to fail in ministry. Okay? He prayed three times. And you know what the Lord said to him? He says, my grace is sufficient. See, we don't employ the strength of grace because we're too busy trying to get out of the problem. Not knowing the problems can be um, handled by the problem solver if we would give it to him and we would rest in the victory that he's already won. The life of a believer should be a life of rest, not struggling and wrestling with God to fix things for us. That completely changes our outlook. It completely changes how we see the test and the trial. If we're always running from the devil, we're never called, we're never doing what we're called to do, and that is to reign and rule in this life. Amen? Amen. But we can only reign and rule in this life when we are resting in his victory. We're trusting in what he did, that it was always and will always be more than enough for every situation we come into. So our perspective has to change. And whether it changes in this life or in the world to come, it will change. And that perspective will be that Christ is all in all, that Christ is everything. Everything you will ever need, everything you would really ever desire is in Him. So our, our, the opportunity arises daily. When you have a test, when you have a problem, when challenges come, we can look at them through ourselves, through what we need, or we can look at them through the one who has fixed it. We can rest in His victory. That's why Jesus said, be of good cheer when tribulation comes. Because I have overcome. I have overcome everything. And what that allows us to do is to look at the opportunity or look at the test as an opportunity. Look at the trial. This is an opportunity for God to be glorified through me, through my life. And because of that, I can rejoice in this situation. 
you know, we've been through a lot these last couple of years. It seems like boom, hit after hit after hit after hit. Anybody feel like that? You just like, every time you turn around, like, bing, there's a new arrow. Amen? Anybody feel like that? Yeah. Yes, I know. But the truth is, once it's over, once the trauma and the drama is over, and you look back at that, sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes it takes months or even longer. But when you look back at that and you remember how you came through it and how God was faithful, you don't feel the same about it as you did when you were in the middle of it, do you? Why? Because the reality and the truth of that victory is what remains. Yeah, you don't, you, you don't feel as broken as you did in the middle of the trial. Why? Because he brought you through it. Because you have advanced. You have increased. And you have overcome. So you don't, you, you know, you don't think about it. You know, I th I th I've talk talked about this before. Jesus today is sitting at the right hand of the Father in all of his glory, isn't he? He still remembers what happened on the cross. But he doesn't, he is not suffering in any way as he suffered then. And the suffering that he endured, not just at the cross, but even in his life as he walked as a, as a son. And in the garden, we're going to look at that today. What he suffered in the garden, he remembers that. But he is not suffering today because of it, is he? He's rejoicing. Why? Because he endured. And he endured the same way you and I endure. We look to the one who has given us victory. We look to it and we maintain our focus on that. Amen? And we, we may fail. Christ didn't. But we may fail in our faith. We may get mad at God, we may get mad at people, we may get mad at ourselves, or disappointed, or any of these things. But yet, we overcome. Amen! Hallelujah! We overcome. We have overcome because He overcame the world. That's wonderful. And the memory, excuse me, the memory of those things. It doesn't hurt us today. Why? Because we have grown. We have gone up a level. We have advanced because he has won the fight for us. Amen? In chapter 12, are you there? Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. Paul's talking about this messenger, this demon that came against him to harass him, to trip him up, to try to get him to fail. You know, the enemy doesn't want anything good for you. He doesn't want anything easy for you. He wants it hard. He wants you to suffer the way he knows he's going to suffer one day. Verse 9, let's start there. So Paul has, has said in this, Paul has said, he's asking God, take this trial away from me, just as we do. Take this test away. When in fact, Jesus said in the middle of the test and the trial, you can rejoice. You can be happy. You can, you, can, you can have an overcoming spirit. But God answered him and said, my grace is always more than enough for you. Every situation, there's grace. There's favor. There's the ability of God. There's the kindness of God. Did you know grace, the word grace, also means kindness of God. Did you know that? In the Greek language, kindness. Kindness of God. These things are available for us. My grace is always more than enough for you, and my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So God isn't looking for your endurance in and of your own self-diligence in and of your own muscles. 
or your own power or your own fortitude. God is actually looking for your weakness to display his strength. Paul talked about the revelations that he got needing that caused the necessity for him to come to a point where he realized, I, I have all this, I've seen all this, but I am nothing. I am nobody in and of my own strength, in and of my own self. And God proved it right there to him when he said, Lord, I can't handle this situation anymore. You've got to take it from me. See, his perspective needed to change. Just like our perspective needs to change. He says, my power, God says, my power, my strength finds its full expression through your weakness, not through your strength, not through your power, through your weakness. So Paul says, so I will celebrate my weaknesses. For when I'm weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. Sometimes we need to fail to understand this perspective. Go to the next verse. Sometimes we need to slip. Sometimes we need to make mistakes to see we need him. We are not sufficient of ourselves. We're not enough. Our strength is not enough. Our knowledge is not enough. Our, our patience and endurance is not enough. I need his power, and his power is displayed in my weakness. So I'm not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. Now, either Paul's way off base, or Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit when he wrote these words. Now, we have to make a choice there individually. He says, for when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am yet stronger. Now, he makes a qualification, you know. We can be hated and we can be persecuted and we can have tests and trials, not just because we love Christ, but we can have these things because we love ourselves. We call it, we bring it on ourselves. We make bad decisions. We're selfish. We live for ourselves. We try to promote ourselves. We all suffer because of that. Paul's clearly saying that's not what I'm talking about here. He says, I'm talking about you and I suffering and having trials and tests because we love Christ. Not because we love ourselves more than Christ. Peter differentiates the same thing. He says, let those that suffer in this life suffer because of Jesus, not because you're selfish, not because you're stupid, not because you're carnal or weak in the spirit, because you're fleshly. Amen? So we, we've got to dis differentiate is why is this happening to me? Is, it, is there something in me that needs to change because I brought this on myself? Come on. If you've lived more than 20 years, you've brought things on your own life. Come on. You've made them bad decisions. You've overcharged your credit. You bought something that you couldn't afford. God didn't make you do that. Amen. You got involved in relationships you had no business being involved in. God didn't make you do that. See, differentiate between selfish motives and motives that cause persecution to come. <coughs> motives that are right. Amen? You understand what I'm saying here? Paul's very clear. He differentiates. His trouble came because of his commitment to God. He says, I have become foolish to boast like this. So in the, in the eyes of the world, when you and I get to a point where trouble comes and we're not overwhelmed, we're actually excited about the opportunity of seeing God be glorified. 
in our life. To the world, that's just foolish. That's what he's talking about. Amen? He says, I have become foolish to boast like this, but you have forced me to do it when you should have boasted in me instead. You should have rejoiced with me, he says. For there is nothing I lack compared to these super apostles of yours, even though I am nothing. The things that distinguish a true apostle were performed among you with great perseverance, supernatural signs, startling wonders, and awesome miracles. Furthermore, how were you treated worse than the other churches except that I didn't burden you financially? Forgive me for depriving you. And then he goes on to talk about the ministry there. Now, I want you to keep in mind that Paul says, I glory or boast in my struggles, in my weakness, in my infirmity, in my trials. Now, go to 2 Timothy, where we're going to start. 2 Timothy, 2nd chapter. Paul literally says, his weakness, his, his frailty, to be able to handle the situation with the thorn in the flesh was a literal portal for the power of God to manifest in his life. A portal. What is a portal? A portal is an opening that's not there before. Something that just supernaturally opens. The next time, it might happen today, it might happen tomorrow, in a week. The next time that you are tested, that you have a trial, that you all of a sudden are in the middle of a tribulation, I want you to think about a portal opening, a portal of heaven. See, we don't get these portals all the time. We get them very often when we need them. When do we need them? When we can't fix it. When we can't make, make it work. When God needs to show up. Portals of heaven are opportunities for God to manifest himself. To display his power. His power comes through the portal to you. And he will deliver. That's what salvation is. He will save. He will protect. Amen? He will heal. He will deliver. That comes through the portal. But if we shut the portal, and we don't let the portal open, we're on our own. And we demand God to do it another way. We haven't experienced the power of the portal as we can. Amen? You kind of getting this? Chapter 2. Timothy. So Paul wrote Timothy, this, these two letters to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, Thou therefore my son, and when he says my son, he's speaking of his love for Timothy, who's a younger minister, he's a pastor, and he's speaking of the relationship and the love that he has for this young man who struggles in the ministry, who's so young, Others don't respect him as a leader. And so Timothy's got issues just like we all do. Amen? But in the, this context, Paul is writing this letter to Timothy to encourage him not to pat him on the back thinking that alone is what he needs. Even though sometimes that's all we want. Isn't it? We just want somebody to approve of us. If that's all Paul gave him, then Paul wouldn't be giving him what he needed. Amen? He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, this is actually, when you read this in other versions, this is exactly what God said to Moses before Moses went out into the ministry. This is exactly what Moses said to Joshua. When Joshua went out into God's ministry, be strong, be courageous. Now, we often think that means, well, I just need to be a tough guy. I just need to be, you know, untouchable. That's not what he's saying. 
He says, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be strong in Him, in His victory, in His presence, in His work. Not in yourself. We're not talking about you going to the cross. Jesus already did it. We're talking about benefiting from His victory on the cross. Amen. He says, be strong, be courageous because of your union with Jesus Christ. And then he go down to verse 3. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness. Now I had to look at this in another version. What, Jesus, what Paul is saying to Timothy is he's talking about enduring or suffering hardships. This isn't necessarily to teach about. Because you're not the most popular person in the room when you're talking about having problems. Amen? But there's a, there's a better side to this story, and this is what Paul is talking about, is that no matter what Timothy faced, what persecutions and what hatred and hostility that would come to him, he could walk through these things like a strong soldier. You know, he, he goes on to say, Meryl, pull this up in the NIV. He goes on to say what it means to be a good soldier in Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, it's talking to you. Get the picture. Soldier. Armies. Right? This is the context. We're in a battle. We're in a warfare, aren't we? And that's how we need to look at these tribulations and trials. He says, no one's serving as a soldier, gets entangled in civilian affairs. Why? Because when you sign up to join the army, they're very clear. Your loyalty and your duty is toward the service. It's not towards other things outside the service. Amen? So your loyalty and your duty in the affairs of this life because you are called to be a soldier in the army of Jesus Christ, your, affair, your attitude, your commitment, your, your loyalty is to him and to his kingdom. Don't be entangled with the affairs of this life. Don't get caught up in what's going outside of the kingdom. It will control your thoughts. It will, it will cause you to become depressed or a slip up frustrated, and snared. It will become hindrance to you. To what? To your victory as a soldier. To your victory in overcoming the battle. We are in battles every day, guys. Well, why does it have to be like that? You're here. You got stuck here. You didn't go there yet. You're here for a reason. Some of us are figuring that out. Some of us are far from Okay, I'm just being honest. We are here for a reason. And that reason isn't just to slide by and enjoy the things of the world. And once we embrace that destiny, it will completely change our attitude. It will change our joy and our ability to have a good life. Amen? Yeah. That's just true. He says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Go to the next verse. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete, so this is another analogy. It's like running a race. Being a believer is like running a race. Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. You can't take shortcuts. You can't do it your way. Well, I want to do it my way. Well, you're not going to win the crown. You're not going to win the prize. You're going to get defeated. You're going to end up in the ditch. And then you're going to say, well, where's God? Well, he's not in the ditch. Why did you take a shortcut? you got to do it your way. No. Paul says, do it his way. And what? You'll receive the victor's crown. Amen. You know, Solomon, so for me, Solomon, Ecclesiastes is difficult to read at times. But Solomon said, the race is not to the swiftest, 
It's not the person who runs the fastest necessarily that wins the prize. What is it? It's the one who finishes the race. Mm -hmm. You know what that takes? It takes endurance. It takes endurance. Now go with me to Romans 5. Let's go to Romans 5, not to go to I'm just introducing this concept. What does it take to get all the way to the end? To finish the fight? Like Paul said, to run my course. Now you can look at this as a daily thing. You have a course to run every day. You can look at it and for the year. You can look at it for your life. It's all the same. The application is the same. Amen? In Romans, the fifth chapter, Paul says in verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, by faith in who? In Jesus Christ, in the finished work of the cross. That's how we are justified before God. Amen? Simply, we are never justified by our own actions. We're never justified by our own works. If we could be, then Jesus would not have had to die. Amen? Therefore being justified, or being made right with God by faith, we have peace with God. And if you don't have peace with God, it's probably because you're trying to justify yourself through your work. But no, we believe on Christ and we have peace with our Father God through the Lord Jesus Christ. By whom, he says, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now what did we just read? He says, be strong and stand in the grace of Jesus Christ. In his kindness, in his gift, in his gifts, in all that he's done, in his victories, he's overcome. You know, when you stand in the grace of God, you are resting on his ability and not your own. If you're not resting, you're striving. You're fighting. You're fighting yourself. You're fighting God. You're fighting people. Amen? We're called to a life of rest. Mm -hmm. And in the life of rest, grace will bring you to places you cannot go on your own. Mm -hmm. By whom we also we have access access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God and rejoice that the glory that God himself, the God of glory, has and has shared with us. Amen. We will see the manifest glory of God. And then this is not someday in heaven in the great by and by. It's today. Amen? It's tomorrow. It's in this life. And not only this, Paul says, but we glory or rejoice in tribulations also. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands. But honestly, ask yourself this question. Do I rejoice? That's what that word glory means there. It's different than the docs of glory. Okay? Do I rejoice in tribulations, or do I whine, complain? It's, this is a good one to put on the fridge. This is a good scripture. And when the tribulation comes, go read it and ask yourself, okay, I have a choice here. I can glory in this problem. I can rejoice in this problem, or I can complain. You see, this is what happened to Israel. In the wilderness, what did they do? They not only complained, but they accused Moses and they accused God. You don't care. Where are you? You know, you either do it according to God's rules, you win the prize according to the way he wrote the rule book, or you don't win. You can't make up your own rule book. Why not? Because you're not God. Your life is like a vapor. Here today, God tomorrow. That is in comparison to God. Amen. But we glory or we rejoice in tribulation also, knowing, okay, tribulation is an opportunity for you to grow. I, I'm enjoying this. I hope somebody's open minded enough to see. The news is good. Amen. 
God is good. He doesn't want us to suffer, but he knows we need change. And he knows that he can manifest himself through the portals of heaven and not only uh, affect your life and affect your change, but be a blessing to you so you can be a blessing, a greater blessing to others. Otherwise, just take us all out of here, God. What's the point? Well, the point is to suffer. The point is to live like a worm. No, no. Then you've completely lost the focus of the cross. If that's all you think, that God has for us in his life, you've completely missed the victory of the cross. And that's a really selfish way to live. Why? Because the victory that you are, you have revelation of, the victory that you have knowledge of and you've experienced, that victory is needed by your neighbor who's living in the chains of, and the jail of sin and darkness. Amen. One of the things that helped Jesus to endure is that he knew he wasn't going to the cross for himself. His focus was always on his neighbor or the one in jail, in the chains of darkness. He did it for you, for others. See, when our focus is only me and me getting out of this mess, that's a miserable way to live. We can live like that. You can have Jesus in your heart and go to heaven. But you'll have a miserable life. I don't want a miserable life. Neither do you. So, he says, knowing that trouble, trials, Situations, difficulties work patience in you. And patience works what? The King James says experience, but that the other versions say endurance. When you experience victory over a trial and that situation comes up again, you don't look at that trial as a victim do you no because god brought you through before and you have victory over that that doesn't mean you'll perform perfectly every time but your attitude towards that tribulation towards that trial is now based on victory mm -hmm. you are not a victim you are a victor through jesus christ you are an overcomer so that trial works a different attitude in us. An attitude that allows us to stand in the grace of Jesus Christ when that comes against us and not lose it. And not, you know, throw ourselves on the bed and have a pity party like we did the first time or the second time. We have now grown in the knowledge of the strength of that victory. And we've completely changed. And some, some of the victories that we've won over the devil, the devil's smart enough to know not to try to pull that again because he won't get away with it this time. Why? Because you won. Because each one of these attributes or characteristics that Paul's talking about here is like steps on a stairway. You're advancing. You're going up. Amen? Tribulation works patience. That's above the tribulations. Patience works endurance. That's above the patience. Amen? And endurance or experience works hope. Hope, what? Hope isn't just wishful thinking. Bible hope is the confident expectation that God is going to come through. Amen. Now let me say something here. When you pray, because you're in the middle of a mess, you have a problem, you have a trial, you have a shortage of something, or you need something, and you don't know how it's come through, do not put your expectation 
on one little thing. This is how it's going to happen, this is what has to happen, and this is when it has to happen. Do not fall into that trap. What? Because your hope should not be on those things. Your hope is in Him. Not those things. When you put your hope and your confidence, your faith in Him, His Word, and what He's promised, then what's Paul say? This hope, you'll never be ashamed. You'll never fall short. You'll never, you'll never feel like God failed me. Why? Because you didn't put God in a box. You let Him be God. If God wants to fix it this way, but I said, no, you got to do it this way, God. You were saying, my playbook, God, my rule book, God, not yours. See, this isn't easy because, you know, we pray, I want this specifically, I have to have this. You know what? Maybe God's saying, well, you really, if I gave you that, I can see down the road that would hurt you. Why? God sees tomorrow. He sees the next month. He sees the next year. He sees eternity, and you and I see the end of our nose. That's what we see. So when you put your hope in Him, He won't disappoint you, and you will never be ashamed. But if you put your hope in this specific answer, you are going to be disappointed. For sure. Hope makes not ashamed. Because of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now go to uh, Hebrews. Jesus, before he went to the cross, he knew he would die, didn't he? The Lord had told him. He knew by the prophetic word that he read, that he studied, the prop, book of the prophets. And he knew by the Holy Spirit of what his mission was, what he was called to. He didn't necessarily know how everything would go, I believe, but he was confident that he would die, and that he would die on the cross. And that has special meaning. Amen? Why? Because the law clearly said, cursed is any who is hung on a tree. And he knew he was called to bear your curse, my curse, the curse of the whole world. He knew that was his mission. And if he died somewhere else, he wouldn't fulfill the law. He wouldn't fulfill what was needed to bring victory for the whole world. Right? In chapter 12, Paul says in verse 1, and I say Paul because that's my opinion. I think after he studied Paul enough, and I could be wrong. I think Paul was the Hebrews. <clears throat> Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed or encircled about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, what's he talking about here? What is this cloud of witnesses? If you read chapter 11, you will see that through this chapter 11, there's all kinds of of testimonies about people who had horrible problems in their lives but endured. Why? Because they trusted God. He says, he says, in that context, he's saying, you're going to have problems in this life, but these are wonderful examples to go through this chapter 11 and to find somebody you can relate to. And no, God brought them through even though they don't, they didn't ever experience in your life what you have through Jesus Christ today. They became victors through the faithfulness of God. Amen? But some of them gave their lives. Some of them were martyred. In fact, one of the Greek words here is martyrs. These witnesses, were. some of them were martyrs. They gave their life for their testimony, for their witness, for their confession. But he says, wherefore, see, you've got this whole history of like believers who've overcome in this life 
by faith in God, by faith in his word. It calls chapter 11 the hall, hallway or hallmark of faith, don't they? He says, with this great evidence, this historical testimonies, these eyewitnesses of God's faithfulness in the worst of conditions, without food, destitute, completely thrown out of society. He goes on and on about what they gave and what they lost. He says, with all that, he says, now let us lay aside every weight. And the sin, which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So that's the context. With that in mind, knowing you're not the only one going through this test. And there have been people who have endured much more, and they got to the end of the race. Okay? Now, I'll pull this up in the passion because I want to talk a little bit about weights. Weights and the sin. Let me start there. The sin that so easily besets us. So, so many times I've read this verse and immediately was condemned by something that I had done. The sin that besets us. You start preaching on sin, and people start making a checklist. Yeah, I did this. I've done, oh, I did this. Oh, no. I'm, oh, God help me. I did this. Come on. But that's not what he's talking about. There is one sin that all of us equally share that affects every person, even those who are born again, who are in the body of Christ. There is one sin that besets us. Did you know that? It's the sin of unbelief. That's it. Unbelief. Unbelief will ruin your life. Will cause you to fall into a trap or a pit, a snare, and become a snare by the enemy. Unbelief. What is that? Not believing. God says about it. About what? About whatever situation you're in. What does God say? You can choose to believe it, or you can choose to reject it. But you will be ensnared by those thoughts if you do not believe his word. Because in his word is life. Not death. Amen? It's life. And life is liberty. So let's read this in the um, Passion. As for us, we have all of these great witnesses in chapter 11 who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Wounds that have pierced us. Wounds that have pierced us. In fact, the commentary for um, for the passion talks about arrows that have pierced our hearts. He says, we have to let go of these things. Well, what is an arrow that has pierced us or bruised us or hurt us? Many times it's because things don't go the way we want them to go or people are ugly or people are horrible to us or say things, or lie about us, or abandon us, or we fail ourselves. We fail God. What happens? Bing! The enemy throws a dart, a fiery dart, of condemnation, of hatred, of hostility, of doubt and unbelief. And we let that arrowhead find lodging in our hearts. Come on. That's natural. Yes, it is. But you are not just a natural being. You are a supernatural being. You are not called to walk through this life with broken arrowheads stuck in your heart. 
with woes, with weights. When he says weights, the Greek talks about things, masses that are heavy. If you get enough of these arrowheads and weights in you, you will no longer be able to walk upright. You'll be damaged goods. That's not God's call for your life. He's called every one of us to live free that we can live in peace and joy. Amen? Well, I couldn't help it. It happened to me. This is not about placing blame. This is about letting go. Why? Because if you want to endure, if you want to run the race, whether it's the race of today, next week, or your life, if you're going to run according to the rule book, which is a book of victory, which is a book of freedom, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, walk with me, learn of me, for my burden is easy, my yoke is light. Easy and light. If your life is not easy and light, I'm telling you, there's some weights dragging you down. Do you notice he says this first before he talks about the sin? This is actually more important than being delivered of the sin. Why? Because if the weights are not taken off of you, the sin will continue to drag you down. So, weights actually keep you running your race. Keep you from the things that God has for you. Did you know that? Weights, arrows, trauma, damage, hurts. We need to let go. How do we do that? How does that happen? Well, for every one of us, it's different. But well, well, what I see in the body of Christ, and I have even seen it in my own life, we have a tendency to just cover the weight up and deny it. But, go on, moving on. If the arrow's still stuck in there, it's going to start to fester. It's going to start to smell and rot. If, in fact, what God w wants for you is liberty, freedom, and for you to finish your race, then you've got to let him have the weight. And for some of us, this might be going back a long way to something that somebody said to us or somebody who hurt us that we need to either forgive them or we need to make it right. Or we need to let it go. Or we need to invite the healing presence of the Holy Spirit to heal it. This isn't, this isn't something we can do ourselves or we would have done it. But a weight will drag you under. A weight will drag you down. Well, I don't see the Holy Spirit knows everything about you. He knows if you've got broken arrow tips in your heart. Come on. And I'm being I'm speaking allegorically. He knows, but he will not take them if you won't let go of them if you're not willing. Verse two. I'll read it up here. We look away from the natural realm. And we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us. The King James says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He is the original or the originator of our faith. Why? Because he lived a life on this earth and he overcame everything that you're facing. Or that you will ever face. He overcame by his faithfulness. Amen? And we fasten our gaze on Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this because his heart was focused on one thing, but he went through his greatest trial, which was the cross. His focus was on the joy of knowing that you 
would be his. That you would be reconciled to the Father. That you would be one with him. He endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured because he looked at the cross, at the trial of the cross, as an opportunity for you, for someone else. This wasn't Jesus, as in the garden, begging to get out of the cross. Jesus never begged God to get out of the cross. Did you know that? He begged God to keep him alive so he could die. Oh. Did you know that? He, remember when he was in the garden, he was, even though the disciples were there, he was completely alone. They were asleep. They weren't with him. There was no one with him but God. And when they woke up, he's like, guys, he says, I have sorrow as unto death. In other words, I'm dying. He believed he could have died there. I'm going to show you scripture next week. But he didn't believe he was supposed to die. He believed he was supposed to go all the way to the cross to finish his race. But he could have died. Many times in the scriptures, Jesus could have died. They threw him off of a hill. They threw him off of a cliff. He could have died. But God kept him. And just as he suffered in the garden. He suffered agony to the point where blood came out of his forehead. I'm telling you what Jesus suffered in the garden was the suffering of his soul. His mind, his will, his emotions. It was almost as bad as the suffering he endured on the cross in his body. But he didn't die. His soul didn't die in the garden. But in, on the cross, he died. But the suffering was so great, he thought he was going to die. He suffered the agony of the weight of sin. Of the thought of bearing the cup, drinking the cup of God's wrath against sin. To the point where he prayed. He prayed and he asked the Lord, help me. And the book of Luke says that God sent an angel to strengthen him. Did you know that? He could have died there, but that wasn't God's plan for him. And through the endurance of the, of the knowledge that one day you would be one with him, he went through the garden, to the cross, and all the way to the grave. Amen. And the victory of the resurrection is yours. It's mine because it's his. Amen. So we'll look at that next week. But the weight of this world were paid for in the garden and the cross. But I'm going to show you in the garden. And that's why he, he sweated drops of blood. Because of the challenge he had in his mind. His soul suffered. Amen. And that victory in the garden is the promised victory of deliverance from any weight you're carrying in your heart, in your memories, in your soul. Because Jesus died for body, soul, and spirit. He suffered for body, soul, and spirit. And he overcame for deliverance of your body, soul, and spirit. Complete. He is the perfecter. He's the completion of your faith. Amen? We have been given victory. And because of that, God himself calls us overcomers. Overcomers. And there is, there may be things in your life that you've been trying to overcome for years. Don't give up. 
Amen. Don't give up. God hasn't given up. He has complete victory for every one of us. Sometimes we just need to have some understanding. And we primarily get it through the Word. Amen. But the Holy Spirit will use His Word to enlighten you to know how to receive. Because it's a matter of receiving, isn't it? Matter, he said, you got to let go of it. To let go of it, you've got to believe that God's going to take it. Amen.